Well, we're here today to talk to Mr. Bob Rogers out on the Cooyarup Swamp because he's the saviour of the Iona Cricket Club, which was disappearing until he came along. Bob, would you tell us a little bit about how you saved the club and when did this first start? Um, well, the actual Iona Cricket Club had disappeared about 1932. It went from about 1890s to 1932, disappeared. Yep. And in 1995, uh, this property came up for sale as part of a deceased estate and uh, I bought it with this crazy idea of starting a cricket club. That's just the loveliest, loveliest idea. <laughs> and did you go to an auction or did you buy it straight out? I went out? to an auction and yep. it was passed in yep. and I was going to walk away and I said, well, that's the highest price and surprisingly I accepted it. Yep. Uh, I was prepared to walk away because I thought it was a pretty crazy idea to be <laughs> and starting a cricket <laughs> club out where, you know, it's fairly... In the middle uh, of nowhere. Well, it's very rich peat soil through here and, I mean, honestly, probably some of the farmers thought I was a bit crazy to do it, but... Uh, just one of those crazy things you do in life, I guess. Well, I think life's full of those really nice ideas. So now we've got this beautiful cricket ground. And when did you actually get the club resurrected again? In 95? 1995, yes. That was very quick going. Oh, well, it took us about two months yep. to do it. Uh, yep. I put a concrete pitch down. We got some roll-out mats. Yep. We used to use electric fencing around the outside and build a little old bark hut that's over the side there. Yep. And... Uh, then I had to go and chase players up and I found out I was 45 at the time and I found out all the people I'd played with, apart from one fellow, Russell Fergus, from, from uh, went to school with, yep. they'd all finished their cricket and retired. So I was lucky enough to find a group of young fellas in Wogel, um, they about 16 or 17, and it's funny, I'm still playing them on Saturdays now and they're all 32 with a couple of young children. So um, it's sort of, there's a whole new generation coming through now. Um, and so these are not these are uh, particular aged guys that are playing today. Oh, today, today's, got, today's match is an over 60s match. Uh, yes. Our club's always had a few older guys, and we've been basically people play as long as they like here mm. because we've only got three senior clubs teams running. Yep. And uh, one of our fellows discovered about three or four years ago this idea of over 60s, and uh, that we've even got a couple of 70 year olds playing. So. Uh, yeah, look, it's very, it's more social cricket, but it's, uh, I mean, the guys, as you'll see today, uh, to come out of the city, to come out here to a cow paddock, uh, play in a cow paddock and have some cattle running around the outside, it's probably a bit of a unique experience for them. It's a pretty unique cow paddock, Bob. It looks pretty good to me. <laughs> Now, looking at this ground, Bob, it's certainly a pretty good cricket field. So do you do the curating yourself? No, I've got a fellow, um, a lawn mowing man from Warrigal. Uh, he comes in and he cuts it each week and he's done a brilliant job. We used to have an old mower and oh, some of our fellows used to try and cut it and that, but it was always breaking down. It's actually far cheaper just to get a professional person in and he does an excellent job. Does uh, a beautiful job. Yeah. Does a beautiful job indeed. And the cattle that we can see over there, over th are they Wagus? Yes, they're full-blood Wagus. Oh, um, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, they were um, they're originally brought out of Japan and they've got the special meat that's quite unique and they're right. worth quite a lot, I think, in terms of steaks, but I've never actually got around to eating one. <laughs> well, you've got a lot of interests, Bob. How did you get started? I, I think you told me you were a school teacher. Or... Oh, originally I was a school teacher yeah. um, and I taught for probably until about 40 and I decided that I'd really want to do... I had always wanted to do other things uh, and I had a very good time when I was a school teacher but I then got involved in share market, uh, some property and then I bought a whole lot of farms that I don't actually run myself but I've got other people um, that lease the farms off me so all my farming's done on the computer really. Oh, that's pretty good. So all of this organisational skill has been a big benefit when it comes to playing, resurrecting a cricket team. Well, resurrecting a cricket club is probably harder than any business thing I've ever done um, <laughs> because it's a voluntary organisation and you've got to have people want to be involved in it. Um, our motto is not about premierships, it's actually our motto is about developing cricketers on and off the field so you know we're very proud of the fact that we've had young fellas that perhaps weren't good cricketers that have become good cricket administrators, um, developed their confidence and brought themselves out. Um, I mean, when I left Which here... Which is one of the big bases of, of cricket being such a wonderful thing for people to do, isn't it? It teaches a lot about ethics as well. Oh, it does, and you'll see here later on this afternoon the camaraderie between uh, and the sportsmanship. Uh, 
I think, you know, some of the friends I've made out of cricket, you know, just really unique people and the diversity of people you meet. Um, you know, one of the things that perhaps younger people don't understand in cricket is it's not necessarily what actually happens out on the field. What's really important is when you come off after the game and you actually chat and find out about what people do and what they're about. Um, and, you know, there's some pretty amazing... It's funny, I probably know a lot of the parents of the people I play against and I'm now meeting the next generation you know through here and I you know I, I know some of the parents uh, and grandparents here uh, but to meet the younger ones coming through um, yeah, it's quite interesting. And giving them a lovely ethic for life I think that's a very important Well I thing, think look it? I'd sooner see kids out having a go doing this than playing computers and stuff like that um, good thing about cricket, the chance of getting injury, but, you know, is probably fairly reduced compared to, say, football and something like that. And the other thing is, you don't have to be any, you don't have to be a particularly tall person, or you don't need any physical, unique features. Uh, even your level of fitness is probably, um, you know, you don't have to have a very high level of fitness to play the sort of level of cricket we're playing, really. OK, Bob, we're going to ask you a little bit about the Cooter Up Swamp, although we call it a swamp. It was once a tea tree swamp that nobody lived on, but it's far from a swamp now. It's some of Australia's best farming land. Would you tell us a little bit about the history of the swamp, when it was first drained? Um, well, my grandparents, both lots of grandparents, came down here around about the 1890s. Uh, one of them settled up near Bunyip, then they moved down a bit further south of where the ground is here at the moment. And the other grandparents were about another, oh, probably kilometre further south. Um, this was all sort of 20 acre allotments that were given out to the people and originally the Bunyip River up there which is you know it's 30 foot deep when it's in flood and has flooded a few times recently. Um, that was a six by four drain, uh, it was dug and guys lived in little bark huts and tin sheds along here and um, you know they used to lay galvanised iron. In fact there used to be from Bunyip out to Iona I believe a little, it was a little um, tramway thing or something like that and from reading on history uh, Iona actually had its own football side and and in 1890, I think, or in 93, beat Trafalgar in a Wednesday comp. Um, so, you know, there was cricket going out here and football at that stage because uh, there was just a lot of people out here working and, um, you know, basically trying to start their life up just after... I think the whole project was probably a bit related to the 1890s uh, depression. It was probably a work sort of scheme. And... Um, I think a fellow called Katani, which Katani's named after, he was the engineer that sort of worked out if you could drain it all. Um, yes, that was Carlo Katani. That's he, right, yes. He's, he's responsible for all of the drainage out at Moe, at the back of Moe as well. Mm. So he must have been a really good engineer. Mm. And the 20 acre blocks here, I, I understand this peat soil is about 12 to 20 feet deep, which is unusual. Do you know if they burnt the peat like oh, the they peat did in Ireland? Peat goes down, like underneath here, um, about 12 foot down you've got a layer of sand. In fact, in the summertime out here on the ground, there's a wide piece of ground that just dries out and it's got sand based and I've got a dam over further that's uh, it's got a natural water thing. At about 11 or 12 foot down there's sort of underground streams under here and before the Bunyip River it just ran through here. It appears that a fellow Streslecki, he was a bit of a, I think a con man and everything's been named after him. Um, he came through here with, I think, a couple of guys and horses, and he tried to get from sort of uh, up on the hills out to Western Port and nearly killed himself and everything, and he came out a hero, and I think, uh, was it the uh, uh, Governor of Victoria, Mr Gibbs, uh, at that time, named things Stres Leckie and stuff like that, but I, I believe from reading history, Macmillan was the real person that should have got recognised for all this, but, you know, this Stres Leckie was probably very lucky um, to Just try... Just a good, good publicist, basically. That's right, good he was very good. I think he got involved in gold mining and stuff <laughs> after, and he was... I think he would call himself Count Stres Leckie, but I think Macmillan, if you look at Gibbsland, was really the, the real person that should have a lot more stuff named after him, and uh, I think Stres Leckie was probably very lucky to actually have ever got through this tea tree because, uh, from what I I gather uh, it was dense sort of uh, tea tree like uh, one of the fellas that I play with here George Lynham his father he lived about um, 5k over and even in the 30s I remember speaking to him and I said how many cows you had and he had three and I said did you have them fenced he said well they didn't go anywhere because the tea tree like there was they weren't so just going, dense. so dense so mm. I mean this this area was probably very easy to clear but when they cleared it they had a lot of peat fires um, and it burned underneath and like underneath here you'll see a yellowy 
part and that's all burnt peat and I know over at my parents place there there were peat fires and stuff that would go smolder for six and eight months so that when they lit the peat they didn't realise it was going Almost to burn. Almost unstoppable. It was unstoppable, yes. Do you think they burnt the, did they cut the peat like they did in Ireland and burn it in their cottages as well? No, 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 they wouldn't have they done that. No, that. I, I think it was, I think probably the peat fires here started in the efforts of clearing it and obviously it's got down into the ground and it was combustible and, and caught fire but they would have never burnt it right. here. Right. Mm. Now they tell me that this wasn't the original spot for the, uh, the cricket ground, that it was further over, Bob, is that so? Well, and there um, were Presbyterian teams and... Well, no, well, what, from what I gather mm. and a bit of history I know, I think I think it was about another hundred yards further over in the paddock, and I think they played under the name Iona Presbyterians, but I'm not totally sure. <laughs> but uh, so I imagine they, uh, you know, probably were very strict and uh, and not interested in drinking that. The other thing that was interesting was the Smutter family here, which I bought the property from. At one stage, it was a cricket team I saw of the 11 players 10 of them were smutters so it was a pretty family sort of orientated thing at that stage um, that was some of the social activity of the time, time you yeah. cricket teams all on your own yes <laughs> Well, that's really interesting, Bob. And as the day goes by, I'm sure we'll hear some more little stories from you. Are there any particular cricketers? I, we noticed in there that there was somebody took a double hat trick. That was quite something. Do you know anything about the history of that? Uh, I think that was a junior that day. But we've had this ground. We've had some. We've had an incredible number of hundreds scored here, and we've had. A, I've been involved in a couple of games out here where I've seen hat tricks occur, and they're not. Uh, they're not sort of common events, no, really. No, so it's quite um, something to get a hat trick. Trick, yeah. Well, look, this is all really interesting stuff, Bob. Thank you very much for talking to us. And I think that the idea of, of reforming the cricket club is really terrific and should be more of it. There's somebody in Central Australia doing the same thing. So we'll look forward to lots more cricket clubs re reigniting themselves. And as the day unfolds, I'm sure you'll think of a few more stories to tell us. It's a pleasure. So we'll look forward to it. Thank you. Time I'm in town. Yeah. 
We're going to chat to John Moore in a moment. He looks like a bit of a bandit to me, but he's an administrator with the Over 60s League. Okay, okay, John, would you tell us a little bit about the Over 60s League? Right, the Over 60s started in 2003. Next year will be 10 years since it began. There was that year there was two teams. Um, we, I played for Casey five years ago, and that was it. Then they had eight teams. This year was 22 teams. Um, it's growing each year. We've got teams from Gippsland, uh, Portland, Geelong, Western Victoria, Sunbury, Essendon, Bayside, Casey, Iona. Uh, this Warrandyte we're playing today, Ringwood. Uh, that, that's just a few of the teams we're playing. So they come from all of those places, from as far as Geelong up to here? Well, as far as Colac, and we've gone as far as Bendigo to play a game. John, do you go away for the weekend when you do these big cricket matches? The, the only time we've been away uh, for a, a game was at Portland. We played two days in a row there. We also went to a carnival in Adelaide. We played four days there. Um, we play usually every second Sunday, and it's not whether you win or lose, it's participation, and that's the key of over 60 cricket is participation um, so that everyone either bats or bowls and enjoys the game. You don't worry about whether you win or lose, it's just the um, in, we're playing the camaraderie, the friendship, playing like cricket used to be played. That's fantastic, John. And can, and can you score a century to go with it today? You're a batsman or a bowler? I'm neither, I'm just there to make up the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed for you today. That's Thanks. terrific. Thank you very much, John Moore. Thanks a lot. Right. I play cricket, mainly. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> We're going to talk to John Martindale now. John, tell me what your position is on the field. On the field? Yep. I'm dictator. That sounds pretty good. Who do you do? You're the captain? Uh, no, not now. I was the first captain of the Iona over 60s mm -hmm. and I was first captain of the KC over 60s before that when they first started KC and from there I was, they play out of Narrawarren North yep. and uh, I was asked to start a club to play here so I was the first captain here. So how did you get them all to come along? How did you get enough players first up? Uh, we are in the middle of nowhere in theory. To hear, oh, someone knew, like uh, Bob and Russell already played with the Iona Cricket Club and right. they'd been playing forever, so... So where did they play for the Iona Cricket Club when it wasn't actually here? Bob played down the city, I believe, and Russell didn't play at all, I think. Oh, and, I see. I mean, so I'd retired. <laughs> yes, I, I'd retired, um, uh, I thought, mm. and Bob rang me up somewhere in 1995, I suppose, mm. and uh, said that he was starting a cricket club and uh, he'd heard that I played cricket. And so he, we got the ordinary eye and a cricket club started. Um, and then... Uh, I managed to persuade some of the over 60s to come down from the city and they enjoyed the opportunity the of playing out in the country and uh, so I was asked then to, if I could form a club to start out, out here. And so have you won a premiership? Does it run like that? No, we don't really play. We, we try and win a game, yep. but we don't play for competition points. Ah, the, that's The Victorian over 60s Cricket yep. Association, it's got about 20 clubs. But uh, the majority, there's been occasional uh, moves towards moves premiership to stuff. having a premiership stuff, and yeah. it's generally been overwhelmingly defeated by the majority of players. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice, really, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it operates more on a participation basis. Mm. Um, mm. The uh, um, <sighs> must must use a minimum of eight bowlers. All right, right. Ooh. And no one can bowl more than eight overs, but right. that only leaves a couple that could do that. Mm. Uh, that must be hard to find eight bowlers. Uh, one persuades them. If you can persuade them to play over 60s cricket at all, you can persuade <laughs> them to bowl. <laughs> Once they know somebody else is a, a bit of a silly bowler, they don't mind having a go. Yes, and then people know people or you yep. run into people playing ordinary cricket and yep. they look as if they're getting towards over 60. So. 
<laughs> when they do that. They've got to put their hand up and then they're in. Yes. That sounds and, lovely. And Iona represents basically from Pakenham to a bit past Warrigal no. and from South Nyora area up to Jindavik and for North So it, it basically covers more than just the Warrigal District Cricket Association, plus part of West Gippsland, plus, plus uh, South Gippsland. And we play against clubs like Geelong, Essendon, Whitehorse, Bayside, which is around the Brighton type mm. area, mm. and so on. Um, so there's going to be no shortage of over 60 players in the future because as the baby boomers extend, you're going to have more and more people that want to play. That's great. Hopefully. Yeah, yes. that's it really is, good. It is growing. And it's an opportunity to do the things you dreamed of as a kid. You know, yeah. I like playing for Australia. I've, <laughs> I played cricket in England now yep. in 2009 by being part of an over 60s team. That well, that's just what there. the world needs, isn't it? That's more cricket all over the world. Yes. Thank you very much for talking to us today, John. I know I hope you go well. Thank you, Philip. Cheerio. Okay, I'll be Matthews. What happened there? Ah, oh, the umpire gave me out. Oh, always a problem, umpires, aren't they? they same are. today? Yeah, same every day. <laughs> just, just as hard to get him for over 60s as it is for under 60s. Yeah. There yeah. you go. There you go. You get another go this afternoon? No. That's it for the day. Yep. You, Don't dust it. You bowling? No. Only fielding for you? Oh, well, depending on the captain, I might keep. All right, keep my fingers crossed for you, Alby. Thanks for talking to us. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to talk to Russell Ferguson, who's the vice captain here, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what happens when you play in the country and you lose the ball over the fence where the grass is so long. OK, Russell, tell us how they find the ball. Well, the players, once they jump over the fence, mm. they've got to be careful that the, there's about six balls in that paddock yeah. and uh, some of the opposition players are not too keen on getting over the fence to get the ball. So if you want to <laughs> So if you want to rest, 
just hit, hit a big six over the fence <laughs> and they take a while, they think about it before they get over the fence to get the ball. The city boys go in the, in the long grass, do they? Well, there's a, we leave a shovel in the shed for the snakes <laughs> if um, we see any. But uh, no, uh, they enjoy it when they come out here. Yeah, I bet they, they do. do. So what if you find the wrong ball? Well, the, if it's a better one, we keep playing with that one. If, it's an, if we're bowling, so, yep. well, we make sure we keep going until we find the right one. But Polish it up and keep yeah, it going. But uh, there's plenty of them over the fence. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty good, Russell. That's, what else happens when you're playing with, with um, over-60s players? Have you ever had to revive anybody? Not sure. But, <laughs> but we think if the Bunyip River's not fast, so we can always... We dunk them. We, we could chuck them in there if they... Oh, something that, happens. Oh, that all but sounds there's pretty good. Good entertainment after the game here. Oh, that's good. We sit down and have a couple of soft drinks. Wives turn up sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> but we have a couple of soft drinks, and uh, if it's a cold night, we've got a fire there. Yep, yep. So we can light a fire. And, and tell me, Russell, what do you like to do? I, I think you're the wicket keeper. Is I'm that the right? wicket keeper. And you're the wicket keeper not only with the over 60s, but quite a few under 60s as well. Yeah, I play on. We play on Saturday as well right. with uh, players anything from about 16 to. 50. And are they tougher than the over 60s? There's some very good over 60s side. Well, that's there terrific, is. isn't we it? Played, we played Mount Evelyn last week, and I, they were very, very good. Do you run There's against some very good batsmen. And do you get any A grade ex, ex Aussies playing, ex Australian representatives? Not, not actually, yet. not yet, but there's been some that's played district cricket. Mm. There's, they're very good batsmen, right. but the bowling and fielding is improving all the time. Oh, that's terrific. Well, nice. thank, yeah. well, thank you very much for that, Good. Russell. It was thank lovely you. talking to you. Thank you. Hope you get lots of people out this t today. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is Steve Pascoe from the Warrigal, the no, the Warrandyte team. He's going to tell us a little bit about cricket in England and playing similar games in England. Thanks, Steve. That's okay. Yeah, we um, get over to England on a reg regular basis, and uh, we play in grounds, village grounds. Yep. Uh, similar to this, this is the Australian version of it. Uh, don't get any corrugated tin uh, sheds over in England, but something very uh, similar, quaint types of ground. It's terrific. Well, this play. one's purpose built, they're not all around the countryside like this anymore. This one's a special job. It is, yes. When you go to, when you go to England, do you, um, do you get put up? Do you get billeted? Uh, no, we go with a, um, a, a club, I suppose, called the Crusaders, and we. Uh, we organise tours through Europe and England uh, every two years. Um, go as a group, there's 35 to 50 people go each time and play teams all over Europe and England. It's I didn't realise they played so much cricket in Europe. What, what countries do you go to in Europe? Um, well, we've been to uh, places like uh, Russia, um, Holland, Germany, uh, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Austria. And this year we're going to Hungary, um, Croatia, back into Italy and in Vienna and then over to England for three weeks after that. And are these people all playing over 60s cricket or vet cricket no. or do you tell us about it, Steve? No, no it's generally open age. Um, we take uh, some young up-and-coming cricketers to run around the boundary for us as far as the 60s are concerned, <laughs> for the older blokes are concerned. Uh, but uh, we, we tend to play a lot of... Um, expatriate English, Pakistani, Indian uh, cricketers that are they're in a, a group in a particular area and, and get a cricket team together. Yeah. How do they organise that? I mean, as it's not really a, a, a popular sport in Europe, how do they find the expats? Big to differ, it is a popular sport in Europe. They have, uh, they're uh, members of the ICC uh, and have um, or, various teams representing their countries. They have their own tournaments at a, a different level. I think it's probably third level uh, international cricket uh, and play uh, play against each other with the view to trying to get up the ladder, you know, into a different uh, level of cricket, yeah. Oh, look, that's really fantastic. Do you think these countries are actually going to get around to having international cricketers like the, the major players? Oh, definitely. Yeah. They, they um, as I say, they do play against each other and uh, I suppose the ultimate is to try to get into the World uh, World Cup competition, which some of the uh, the lesser lights have in the past, um, and uh, probably the uh, most successful in Europe would be out of Holland, uh, and um, 
and it, Italy, for example, would play probably a third level situation. And, and uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest from um, the local Italian people um, coming through, uh, but certainly the majority of it would be through um, expatriate um, Sri Lankans, for example, in in Italy, um, and uh, probably Indians and. Pakistanis elsewhere, plus the English, of course. So wherever the English goes, there's the cricket ground. So. Well, that's lovely, mm. isn't it? The, the Dutch are they're just an amazing lot. Here they are out here playing world-class um, hockey, yeah. You're really throwing it up to us. No matter what they do, tiny little nation, they're a very vigorous, tough lot, aren't they? They seem to be able to do anything, the Dutch, yeah. and now they're playing cricket as well. Yeah, Gee, we'll have to watch it. for a long time, <laughs> uh, there's no doubt about that, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Steve. That's really That's very okay. interesting. It's lovely that this village-type atmosphere, you can go over and see how it really is in, in England and bring it back and it yeah. carries on here as well. Well, yeah, this is just magic. It is, isn't sure it? We had more grounds like this. That's great. Thank you very okay. much, Steve. It's been something seeing you again And in this time we've had to spend You've been so good to be around and I thank you for that special thrill Keep me going on until The next time I'm in town It's been something seeing you again And in this time